Tonight on The Best Times, we explore some of the little-known historical facts, figures, and events that shaped Memphis. And you'll get important answers to basic questions about colon cancer. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. There is nothing new in the world except the history you do not know. That quote is attributed to President Harry Truman. The history we learned in school was mostly about wars and disasters, kings and queens and presidents and generals. But much of the time, history is made by people you've never heard of. Tonight, Wayne Dowdy, archivist with the Memphis Public Library, brings us a few stories about Memphis and the history you do not know. Well, Wayne, uh I know you've got some stories to tell. Mm -hmm. The first one is a story that I was not aware of. I had never heard of Mary Morrison, mm -hmm. but uh, she was the precursor of Rosa Parks, correct? Indeed, indeed she was. Uh, Mary Morrison was a uh, washerwoman in Memphis, an African-American, who in 1905 boarded a uh, streetcar in Memphis and refused to sit in the, white se in the black section. She sat in the white section and refused to move to the back of the streetcar. And we don't know that much about her, unfortunately, except that she was very brave and really laid the foundation for uh, so the civil rights movement that was to come 50 years later. Um, her story uh, galvanized the African-American community in Memphis. Uh, the state of Tennessee had just a few months before passed a law, the Hancock Law, requiring segregated city, uh, seating on public transportation. And an interesting fact about that, the city of Memphis did not want that law to pass. They tried to block it in the legislature, but were unsuccessful. So Nashville as well and Chattanooga were also opposed to it because they believed that it was an undue burden mm -hmm. on uh, the locality and the streetcar companies themselves said this is going to cost us money. We have to put, put new signs in. We have to do all these kinds of things. But the law passed. The city and the streetcar company were required to, uh, to enforce this law. But Mary Morrison was under no obligation, she felt, to follow that law. And so she was promptly arrested, charged with uh, violating the state law. And um, as I said, this, this really galvanized the uh, African-American community. A mass meeting was held to uh, protest what had happened to her and also to raise money for her legal defense. And there were two very prominent African-American attorneys in Memphis, Josiah Settle and Benjamin Booth, who agreed to take her case. And they were very clear at the beginning why they were taking this case. They wanted to challenge the law, the segregated law, and they wanted to take it to the state Supreme Court. They figured they would lose in the lower courts, but if they could take it to the, the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court, maybe they could get it overturned. Booth and Settle were able to take it to the state Supreme Court. They lost, unfortunately. But their case, their argument about that the law violated the Equal Protection Clause in the Constitution and also due process because Mary Morrison was not arrested by a police officer. She was detained by the driver 
which oh. gave him police power that he did not have, you see. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the arguments. And, and indeed, it was also one of the reasons why the streetcar company was opposed to the law. They're saying, all of a sudden, we're going to have to, these guys have got to be policemen, too. And so in the 1950s, when uh, other African-American lawyers are arguing against uh, segregation at the public library or um, uh, other institutions in Memphis, they're using some of the same arguments as Booth and Settle, and it's Mary Morrison who started the whole thing. And she fades into history. We don't know what happened to her. Um, unfortunately, it's a common name. There was only one African American in 1905 in the city directories named Mary Morrison, but she disappears from the city directories. I don't know what happened to her. I hope she got married and had a <laughs> had happy a good life, life, had a good life. She deserved she it. She certainly did, yeah. but it's, uh, it's it, she is someone who um, deserves to be remembered, and uh, hopefully in a small way we're doing that. Now, America is a country of immigrants, That's of right. course, and Memphis in this area, we certainly have our share of immigrants we who built indeed. this city. That's right. Some that you've told me about that mm -hmm. surprised me, so talk about well, the immigrants. that's the thing about Memphis that in studying the city, uh, we have a tendency to write our history as a white-black uh, story because we think in, in terms of that and because the majority of the population has been white and black. But Memphis, historically, has been an immigrant town. Uh, in the 19th century, you had uh, Chinese uh, uh, immigrants living in Memphis. Beale Street was dotted with laundries and uh, a couple of grocery stores owned by Chinese. Uh, many Chinese came to Memphis because they had first settled in Mississippi. Mississippi uh, forced them to send their children to the African-American inferior schools, uh, but Memphis had no such restriction. So Chinese went to the white schools in Memphis. So um, uh, that to me is a fascinating fact about how we view, excuse me, viewed the world. Um, uh, we weren't quite so forgiving or quite so uh, helpful to our African-American neighbors, but uh, uh, if you weren't African-American, uh, there was a tendency to see you as quote-unquote white, which seems silly. It is silly, not just seems, it is silly. But uh, that's the mentality of the day. But that meant that the Chinese population could grow and assimilate and contribute uh, with no restrictions here. Uh, Memphis also has a, uh, an early Hispanic population who lives here. Even before Memphis is uh, a city, the Spanish government uh, controls the Mississippi Territory, which includes Memphis and West Tennessee. The, um, the, the Spanish send a governor who is headquartered in Memphis over the Mississippi Territory, a man named Manuel de la Gayoso. Every time you drive down Quince, which is Quince, and you know <laughs> you're you're driving down a Hispanic street in a in in, in effect. So um, there's that. Uh, the Italians and the Irish, of course, made huge contributions to the city. And uh, for me, I think it is a story that we don't talk enough about. I mean, obviously, we've dealt with issues of immigration over the last 20, 25 years when the Hispanic population started to grow, and I think people, and then also in the, a little bit earlier with Catholic Charities bringing in Vietnamese, uh, who have all made contributions to the city, but we sort of seem, we think of that as a modern uh, event, but it's actually been going on in Memphis uh, since the beginning. Now let's talk about the story of Hope Brewster. <laughs> as, I, as I just told you, mm -hmm. if, um, if this had been a screenplay submitted to a Hollywood production company, they would have rejected this as just not believable enough. That, that is very true. Hope Brewster was a 22-year-old uh, music student, a violinist, uh, in Memphis. And in the spring of 1939, she was very frustrated by her lot in life. She really wanted to be a successful concert violinist. So one Sunday night, she's laying in bed and she's tossing and turning and, and uh, thinking, God, I've got, I've got to do something. I've got to get out of this town. I've got to find a way to be more successful. So by the next morning, she had decided that she would uh, take a boat and row it to New Orleans 
and then make her way to the Virgin Islands. How she thought she was going to get from <laughs> New Orleans to the Virgin Islands, I'm not sure. Uh, but nevertheless, that was her plan. So she goes to, she takes a streetcar to the, the riverfront, buys a small skiff boat, and uh, she has one bag that has a couple of shirts in it and some lipstick. And uh, she starts rowing down the Mississippi River. And she doesn't have a compass. She doesn't know, uh, she knows New Orleans is that way. <laughs> That's about it. And uh, so she just starts rowing. It starts to rain in the early morning. Uh, she climbs out of the boat and hides under a log for a while until the rain passes, then gets back on and takes, and, and the river bends at this point, and she finds herself in Helena, Arkansas, which of course is nowhere near New Orleans. And uh, so she gets out, she is filthy and hungry and tired, and she goes into a cafe, and the, by this time, she, she was front page news. So the people in the cafe say, hey, aren't you that girl? And she's like, well, yeah, I am. So they call Memphis her, her uh, she's actually not living with her parents, she's living with uh, a friend and her parents who were basically her guardians. And uh, they come and get her, and a, and a couple of police officials come to and say, hey, you need to come back to Memphis. And she reluctantly agrees. And she thinks, my life is over with. My plan failed. But she gets home, and there's a, uh, a message from a man named uh, David Rubinoff, who was a very famous um, uh, classical, um, uh, com not composer, a conductor, who happened to be in Memphis performing. And he saw the news and he sent her a message, called her home and said, if I can ever help you in any way, let me know. The WMC radio calls her later that day and say, look, we have this show called Stars of Today and Tomorrow. We'd like you to perform. So she does. And then she starts getting jobs. <laughs> and she eventually, an orchestra hires her to perform. She travels all over the world, works with the USO during World War II. Uh, performing for troops, um, so she becomes what she wanted to be, and she had, she thought she was a failure, but in effect, her ill-starred <laughs> <laughs> uh, journey led to her uh, becoming, at least for a time, a well-known violinist. Nothing is stranger than history, that is, is it? very true. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe, maybe she eventually made it to the Virgin she Islands. She may we have. We don't know. Uh, we don't know. That's yeah. right. <laughs> well, uh, staying in the Hollywood mode, mm -hmm. um, there have been a lot of films that have That's been right. made here and then That's shot right. in the area. Uh, and you tell a story about a Route 66 mm -hmm. episode, which was one of my favorite shows when was I was it? growing up as a kid. It's a good... I don't remember this episode, yes. but you've got a story about it. Well, Route 66, of course, was a story of uh, two young men who were traveling the United States. They don't actually go on Route 66 itself very often. They seem to be everywhere but Route 66. But... Uh, they're going to, to different places, and what's fascinating about that show is the producers were very committed to realism. They did not shoot on a back lot in Hollywood. They went to the locations where the stories were being told. So in the fall of uh, 1962, they come to Memphis. Martin Milner comes, and the first scene you see is him driving down Riverside Drive and he pulls in and uh, the story revolves around there's a girl that they had uh, run into before in a previous episode and um, he discovers she's, she's, he sees her driving down Riverside Drive like hey wait a minute so he follows her and uh, there's a running joke where he keeps running into the same police officer. What's fascinating is what you can see in the episode uh, people can debate about whether it's a good episode or not, but uh, you get to see the interior of the Cotton Exchange because one of the characters is uh, the son of a, of a wealthy cotton merchant. You see the inside of the Chiska Hotel and what a room looked like in 1962. Um, you see, of course, what Riverside and what downtown looked like. Um, it's just, and, and most importantly, really, they show uh, the Paradise Club, which was a small club operated by uh, an orchestra leader named Ben Brandt, well-known local performer here who was in the parking lot when Dr. King was murdered in 68. He was going to perform at the, sir, at the uh, protest uh, meeting that night and, had, and was there. And it shows the interior of this very small space um, 
And uh, in fact, somebody emailed me after the after I shared this story the first time and said, we never knew what it looked like mm -hmm. until you pointed out that it's in that episode. So you get to see about five minutes of, of Ben Branch performing and uh, seeing people in a nightclub. And you see what nightclubs were like <laughs> in Memphis, kind of gritty, kind of, you know, what you would think of. Memphis comes off very, very well. It doesn't poke fun of the city. In fact, it's very reverential towards the city. And um, Memphis is a character in, in the episode. So for us, it's just fascinating to be able to see how they viewed us, and they viewed us in a very positive light. Uh, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, Memphis was the site of a, a number of maritime disasters. That's right. That's right. um, I think uh, think back to the Sultana, of That's course, right. is one of the most That's famous right. and most tragic. Right. Um, but you tell a story about a steamer called the Golden City. The Golden City was um, uh, a very, actually, very well known uh, riverboat at the time in the early 1880s, and uh, they carried passengers and and cargo. And uh, in the spring of 1882. They're also carrying uh, a circus troupe, including animals. Just as they are pulling in to the dock, to the, to the wharf, uh, the boiler explodes. And the, uh, uh, they, are, they are actually floating near Beale Street, but the wharf is past Beale Street. But there is a landing there. And so he swings the boat towards Beale Street and uh, the boat is on fire. There's a, uh, uh, an engineer named Robert Kelly who is extremely brave, stays at his post until, uh, until he died, unfortunately. And uh, the, um, the captain and uh, the uh, chief engineer and his son were very brave and did all they could to save the passengers. Uh, but in the end, 50 people lost their lives, as well as some circus animals. But there are some, some fascinating stories. The, the, uh, probably it's a horrific thing. Uh, there are river men all up and down the city reporting for work. Uh, a group of them get on skiffs like Hope Brewster did much later and uh, floated into uh, the area around Beale Street to try to help survivors. And one of them comes up to what they think is a man, and he crawls into the boat, and then he discovers it's not a man at all, it's a bear. <laughs> and he's like, oh my God, and he starts to jump out of the boat, but the bear just lays down in the bottom of the boat. So he says, well, okay. So he floats into the, uh, into, into the uh, harbor into, um, and, and lands there at Beale Street, and the bear gets up and just walks away. <laughs> okay. These stories are fascinating. You know, I, I'm just curious, as a historian, mm -hmm. what, what is it that fascinates you about history? What fascinates me the most is that we have a tendency to believe that history is uh, created by the famous, by uh, the leaders, the presidents, the generals, and so on. Uh, but it's the opposite. Uh, it, all of us are historical figures. That's what fascinates me because everybody, every day, makes decisions that impacts history. And so for me, I'm far more interested in the lives of the people who built Memphis and the country and the world uh, than I am the people who led them or say they led them. Uh, but, but we need stories, we need books about I hate the word ordinary because there's no such thing as an ordinary person. We're all extraordinary and that's not a touchy-feely thing, that's a fact. And uh, everybody's story is important and so trying to tell those stories that people don't see as of famous people is what excites me about history. Well, Wayne, thank you very much You're for sharing very, very some of these fascinating absolutely. stories with us on The Best Times. You're welcome, thank you for having me. Colon cancer is the third most common cancer in the United States. This year, nearly 100,000 new cases of colon cancer will be diagnosed. It's the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in women and the second leading cause in men. But it's a highly treatable disease if 
it's diagnosed early. In fact, there are one million colon cancer survivors in America today. Let's get some answers to basic questions about colon cancer and you. What causes colon cancer? Well, I wish we knew. Um, there, are, there is no one specific cause for colon cancer. So most colon cancers are what we call sporadic. That is, they occur without any known uh, risk factors for it. What are the risk factors? Age is probably the single biggest risk factor for developing colon cancer. That's not to say that it can't occur in younger people. In fact, recent research has suggested that there's an increase in the risk of colon cancer in people in their 20s and 30s. We, we don't really understand why that's happening. But still, age, increasing age, is the major risk factor for colon cancer. What are the symptoms? So the symptoms that we tend to associate with colon cancer and the symptoms that people should be aware of would include bleeding from the rectum or noticing blood when someone goes to the bathroom to have a bowel movement. Some people may notice a change in the frequency with which they're having bowel movements, maybe a tendency to become more constipated. Some people may notice a change in the character of their stool, a, a, a thinner, narrower stool, for example, sometimes suggests colon cancer. And then colon cancer can sometimes also present just with anemia, a low blood count, and those patients may have no uh, intestinal symptoms whatsoever. How important are colon cancer screenings? Screening is very important because it takes a long time for colon cancer to develop, and most colon cancers develop from things that we call polyps. And if we do a screening examination on a patient who has no symptoms, and we find polyps, and we can remove those polyps, then we have very, very good evidence that we reduce that person's risk of ever developing colon cancer. And that's what screening's all about. When should screenings be scheduled? Now, for people who have no gastrointestinal symptoms and no known family history of colon cancer, we consider those people to be at average risk for the development of colon cancer. And in those people, screening should generally begin at the age 50. For people of African-American heritage, screening might want to begin a little bit earlier, say around the age of 45, because African-Americans have a higher risk of colorectal cancer than other racial groups. And if the colonoscopy is normal, and the doctor has been able to examine the entire colon, then we can be pretty reassuring to the person that he is, there is uh, no evidence of any uh, problems related to colon cancer. And at the moment, a recommendation to such a person would be come back in 10 years for your next colonoscopy. Does gender affect the risk of colon cancer? So women and men are both at risk of colon cancer. Perhaps men have a slightly increased risk and a slightly earlier age of development of colon cancer, but these differences are minor. So colon cancer is an equal opportunity employer. Men and women are essentially affected equally, and women should not defer screening for colon, for colon cancer. I've heard that a daily dose of aspirin can prevent colon cancer. Is this true? All I would say at the moment is if someone's considering taking aspirin to prevent colon cancer, pause for a moment and talk it over with your doctor. Aspirin still carries some risk of bleeding from elsewhere in the intestinal tract, so it's, it's, it's worth considering before you take that move. We are not yet at the stage of recommending aspirin routinely to prevent colon cancer, but there's a lot of information and uh, discussion out there about that. Can colon cancer be prevented? Uh, if someone wanted to reduce their own risk of colon cancer, the best evidence that we have at the moment is that they should take a diet that is relatively low in animal fat and in red meat, 
and that has a lot of fruits and vegetables and whole grains in it. So remember what your mothers used to tell you, you know, eat your vegetables. Mothers are generally right about that sort of thing. How survivable is colon cancer? Well, if caught early, it's, it's very survivable. So co colon cancer is something that can be treated. In some patients, it can be cured. But to go back to your last point, the earlier the better. So the earlier we can diagnose it, the earlier we can get ahead and treat it, and the greater is the chance of the patient being cured of it. For more answers to your questions about colon cancer, go to the website of the American Cancer Society. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plough Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.